this. With all that said, I want to talk a little bit about follow first and, and the genesis of that. You read the introduction and uh, supposedly the first couple of chapters. I, could, I, I, I want you to know uh, we'll never make it through uh, all that material that you read. So, thanks for reading ahead. <laughs> when, when, when you look at this, uh, this little thing before you, let me, let me just say how this came about. Because I, I really hesitated to write this book. And the reason why I did is because I didn't want to become that guy. Well, well if you look at my book, you know, that, that kind of thing. And you know those guys. But then I, I have a ministry uh, apart from teaching at uh, the school. And one of the members of the board of directors, she came up to me and she said, Dr. Rickinson, you, you certainly have a, a lot of great information here and you teach it so well. So uh, let me ask you a question. I said, sure. She says, what are you going to do when you die? <laughs> I said, well, I hope I go see Jesus. <laughs> uh, uh, no, she meant, you know, what are you going to do with the material? And uh, that really, that really sparked me to think, okay, what, what happens to this stuff? If it's halfway decent and some people are blessed by it and people are engaged with it and it is encouraging them to become more of what God wants them to be, then what happens to that material when you die and you can't verbally communicate it? Because that's all I was doing at the time, was verbally communicating and recording it. And, I, and I'm going to date myself. I said, well, you could get the cassettes. <laughs> uh, she said, that's not good enough. And so she encouraged me, encouraged me to put it down on paper. And so for eight and a half months, it was, just, it was the gestation period for the birthing of, of this book. And then, of course, the second second edition came several years later uh, with that. And all of this to say that you, you have all the permission in the world to question everything in the book. It's not inerrant. You've probably seen some great typos and things like that. And it's not infallible because it is not the Word of God. Mm -hmm. uh, but hopefully, it does communicate the truth of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And but I, I'm, I, I want you to know that I'm, I'm well aware of, and you probably are too because you work in a church, the dangers of miscommunication <laughs> and how all that can just kill things. I don't want to miscommunicate anything. If, I'm, if, if, if it's not teaching what the Lord wants it to teach, then I don't want to teach it. So I ask you to help me in sort of a peer review type of endeavor here uh, to just point out things like, and question. You'll not embarrass me. Well, maybe you'll embarrass me. <laughs> but, but I'll get over it because embarrassing me will simply be a good way for me to tamp down my ego which needs tamping down regularly. On that case, is everybody good? Yeah. You ready to dive in? Well, we'll dive in in every good teacher's way and that is by way of review. Remember last week we talked a little bit about a diagram, correct? Where we had this line right here and we had, what, what was on, on this spot here? Thank you. And then what's here? Ball. Okay. All right. So the overall atmosphere of creation was. Thank you. Man, I love this crowd. And the overall is what? Control. Thank you. Now, as you thought about that this week, have you uh, over the last several months? Uh, excuse me, several weeks. Uh, have, were you able to see this in action in, in certain dynamics? Mm -hmm. um, what, what did we call this? We call this world what? One. 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 World One. 
And then we call this what? World Two. World Two. And because of, of all the dynamics that take place here with the lives of, of, of the first parents and then everything that took place in the fall, Jesus came along for the purpose of restoring human beings back to a world one value system. And that's why what I want to emphasize to you always is that follower first is not a program. Okay? It is a philosophy. It is a way of thinking about leading. That's, that's what it is. I, in certain instances I, I have uh, people come up and say, well, how do you do follower first? I say, you just think that way. And then the do happens. Because I'm fully convinced that if you can change a person's thinking, you can change their behavior. But before... It, it, see, if you, if you don't begin by respecting a person's right to choose and their will to choose <coughs> as free moral agents, then you just become a coercive person who seeks to manipulate people through whatever means you have. And let's be honest, in the religious world, guilt is one of the best tools we use <laughs> to try and manipulate people into service within the church or into giving to certain things or even to, to move forward with a program that the church is moving forward. We can sometimes, I, I hope we can catch ourselves before we move into that territory, but perhaps you've been uh, engaged in some of that in the past where you recognize, well, you know, that really wasn't my decision. You were trying to guilt me into doing that. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to be honest here, and we always try to be honest, and that is, sometimes we can do that when we recruit. Mm -hmm. Do we not? Mm -hmm. Of course we do. Uh, because we think in a power and control environment world in which we live, that's how we can move people and get them to do what we want them to do. I want you to do, listen to me, do what I want you to do, because when you do what I want you to do, you'll be doing what God wants you to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to buy pictures of emaciated dogs and put them on the you, you know, uh, just, just I'll tell you, some, some of the charities that tug at your heartstrings and things like that, that want you to give there, the one about the elephants, I've often thought, why don't we put a bunch of babies up there and say, hey, why don't you give money to adopt a baby and keep it alive and then get an adopted family? No, it's elephants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that tells you a lot about the culture. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, when we're moving in that direction, that's why follower first philosophy or a perspective is so difficult and it requires constant reminders and constant action in that way. Because I, I want, I'll be honest, I want to change your minds about what it means to serve in a church. I want you to change your mind about what you may think is your role overall in the church. That sounds kind of dangerous. The pastor's here. He's going, where, where are you going with this? Actually, one of the unhealthy things that has happened in our churches is that we have allowed World II philosophies to infiltrate God's beautiful church. Because Jesus comes, and, and he, he even calls the church the ecclesia, right? We talked about this last time. What is that? The called out ones? What are you called out from? You're, you're, you're called out of World II to operate as World I. 
until World 3 shows up. I just thought about that. World 3 is what? The new heaven and the new earth. <laughs> so we, we've all got these realities in which we operate. And we are, we, we are we're challenged with a follower first philosophy in that world 2 is where all of us live but especially our folks in the business world who we depend on to actually participate in the life of the church mm -hmm. and you know when when you're busy with your job monday through sometimes Saturday and you're constantly engaged in a power and control environment it really takes some time to change your mind about how to do things mm -hmm. and when we're told by some well-meaning Christian people that all you have to do is take a business principle and baptize it with a few scriptures and implement it into the church, then your church can really be a success. Well, I think, and I believe your pastor would, would agree with me, and that is, we, I want you to move away from the idea of success. Okay? I would rather you move in to the idea. How do you spell fulfillment? F U L. <laughs> Nobody's offering. <laughs> Is it F U L or yes. F U L L? Yes. One L. One L. One L. One L. One L. One L. And then Phil. W F I L L. M I L L. Phil. And then I was meant for this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that says is fulfilling. <laughs> See the beautiful thing about having a terminal degree is you don't have to spell. <laughs> That'll be joyous. So the idea of fulfillment is where I want you to go. In this, too, we live in a pragmatic time, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of setting the stage because I've had this question when I'm teaching this and when I've gone to other churches. Does it work? And I go, well, let me ask you this. Does the gospel work? Well, you know, let's... let's because the, the, the issue of the gospel is not whether it works or not. Mm -hmm. It's the truth. Mm -hmm. And the truth honors God. And that's the way I, I see this teaching. Does it work? Who knows? But does it honor God? I believe it does. Mm -hmm. And so if, if your church wants to honor the Lord, we begin by changing our thinking and moving in that direction. Now I know that's dangerous. You've been well taught to guard your mind. Okay? So, guard your mind. Don't be influenced by me or anything else. But if, it re if, if this information resonates with you, then let's talk about it. Okay? Is that a deal? So there, there you go. When we talk about the, the idea of follower first, you, you have... You had the opportunity to look into the introduction here. Uh, and there's a definition of follow first on page 11. So if you have your, your book before you there, listen, listen to this. Follower first perspective may be defined as a system of thought according to which one willingly follows the Lord Jesus Christ with all one's heart, mind, soul, and strength in every circumstance, regardless of organizational position, while submitting to fellow followers so that all might be fulfilled in their God-given responsibilities. 
All right? So let's break that down for just a minute. It's a system of thought. I've already laid the groundwork for that. It's just a way to think about operating within your life and operating with other people. According to which one follows the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of course, I glom on the scripture here where what what what's what's the greatest commandment? It's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your strength, right? And the second is like unto it, which is what? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But you can't do the second commandment without actually living the first one. Because if you're giving your heart away to God, then you can love other people without requiring them to love you back. Because that's what God loves. <laughs> God loves us, but He doesn't require us to love Him back for Him to continue to love. Aren't you glad God continues to love us? Not only when His children don't love Him back, but when the vast majority of the world doesn't love Him. He still loves this dirt ball uh, filled with people. And so, there you have it. it. It's with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and strength in every circumstance, regardless of your organizational position. So, we've got identified here several organizational positions, do we not? Each one of them vitally important to the functioning of this organization. Now, I hope you're not offended if I call the church an organization. Okay? I, I know that some people say, well, no, it's an organism. That's, that, that's true. But amoebas are organisms, and they even have a nucleus. So, uh, without organization, uh, you're just a blob. <laughs> All right? You've got to be organized. And God, by, by His beauty, is an organized God. Is He not? So, our organized God decided when He was going to create a people and call them out of World 2 and move them into World 1, these people were going to be organized and he organized them as the ecclesia, the ones that were called out. And in the epistles, he outlines specific ideas with regard to how that needs to be done. But I would submit to you that all of that that's predicated to the epistles is predicated upon the understanding that people were followers first and foremost. That that becomes the primary objective of their life was to follow Christ. Now, when you put that idea into historical perspective, <clears throat> it, it literally is put to the test when your wife and children are thrown into a lion pit unless you deny Christ. We don't, we don't, we, we, by God's grace, don't have that to have to deal with and to test whether we are truly followers of Christ. Are you going to follow Him to the end kind of thing? But what we do have is we have daily, what I call, mental termites <clears throat> that try to eat away at the truth of what Scripture is teaching us. Mm -hmm in how to respond to people. And those termites are fed usually by a good supply of ego. <laughs> because the ego, man, it's just a stockpile of goo that often gets in our way. Uh, I mean, what's the number one thing that you cannot do in any setting, anywhere in America today. Offend somebody. Oh. <laughs> you can't offend... This is a double negative, but it speaks truth. You can't offend nobody. You mean, you can't offend anybody. You I take can't. offense to that statement. 
Do what? I take offense to that. <laughs> you have every right to take offense, and I have every right not to care. Um, <laughs> so you know, that's why we were walking around eggshells with all this stuff. I was talking to a friend who has uh, a, a buddy of his who teaches in the public school system, and he says, look, I'm, I'm ready to bail. He said, why? He says, because it's filled with landmines. Mm -hmm. You have to be so careful of what you say and how you say it and other things like this. You can't offend anyone. And so what we're, we're one big pus-filled pile of offense. Mm -hmm in our culture today. Just waiting for somebody to inadvertently come along and go pop, and it's, you know, heaven forbid that it ever get in the news, because then you get canceled. Right? So we're actually talking about a wonderful World two experience, I say wonderful facetiously, in that now, you talk about power and control. I've got ultimate power and control. And that is individual power and control. Not as a society where, now in the South, I was raised in the South, we had a culture of respect and honor and opening doors for ladies and doing things and other things like that. That's, my, that's still my culture. If you yell at me for opening the door for you, God bless you. Just yell and go through the door. Uh, but here in this, in, in, in a World Two culture, it's not just a, a pervasive culture, it's an individual culture. Yep. And that has um, become very persuasive, uh, pervasive in the church as well. Unpack that for me. Well, um, not, not to mention any names, but, but you see a lot of, I have seen a number of larger church ministries compromise truth um, and bow to what we might call the woke culture uh -huh. in order as not to offend. And, and the bottom line is because the thought, the thought in the pew is more influenced by the woke culture than by Scripture by the Word of God. So, so the pastor kind tells to that. Yeah, he prevaricates on yeah. strong language perhaps or, or whatever. Now, the good news is, I think, going forward is that because the woke culture does not, it, it, it does not uh, correlate sufficiently to reality, mm -hmm that it is just simply a matter of time before it burns out. Yeah. And you can already see little glimmers of uh, even Hollywood people stepping up and saying, you got to be kidding me. Right. You, know, you got to be kidding me. Um, and, and, and that's encouraging to me. But you're, you're right. And so in, in our culture, let me just say, Paul writes that you know the gospel is going to be offensive to some. Here's my point. I don't want to be offensive. <laughs> right, right. So if I, if I can avoid offending you, yeah. I'll do it. But if the life that I live and the truth that I live offends you, then, then you know we're just going to have to love one another and you're just going to have to be offended. Is that okay with everybody? We'll mm -hmm. just move from there. So when you look at the definition moving forward, it's the, the, you're loving Jesus. And so if your role is a housekeeper in the, in the organization, you're loving Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. If your role is pastor, you're loving Jesus. If your role is uh, preschool minister, uh, you're loving Jesus. If your role is uh, finances, you're, you're loving Jesus. Your primary objective and the role that you have within the church is to love Jesus. Move away from that and things start breaking down. That, that's that's going to be primary in about three months. 
<laughs> when we come back to that very thing. And then, regardless of organizational position, while submitting to fellow followers. Now there's a diagram, I don't know if you got to it um, in the book or not, but there's a diagram in the book that talks about Christ being the head of the church. Mm -hmm. And with Christ, you have different, you have different, I don't mind if I change from red to red. You have different people in the church. Now, before I go into this, let me just say this about that. I don't care what your organizational chart is. Because this is just a pictorial representation of the way information flows. What, you, what, what we come to understand in the follower first philosophy is that everybody, first and foremost, was created to be a church made up of followers. Not leaders. Leaders comes next. So we're all followers. And so as followers, everybody in, in Jesus' church operates at the same level, listen, get, get this, of respect. Now, in our culture, certain positions within the church garner greater respect. That's not a function of the scriptures. That's a function of human beings. Right. Okay? So the fact that the church wants to honor the pastor, I think that's a very good thing. But I also think they ought to honor the person that doesn't have a position, but picks up the paper around the place. Amen. You know? Amen. Let's, let's bring, bring honor to, to that service. Because the pastor is just serving. Where he is called to serve. What we're trying to do with a follower first idea is to teach every person in this church that they, that person, as a follower of Christ, has a role and responsibility within the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why today, if we follow the leadership culture of World 2, why we get to the place where we've got so many people letting you guys do all the work. <laughs> I mean, let's face it. How many people on a Sunday morning are coming in enjoying a great worship service that you guys have orchestrated and put together and, and, and are, are implementing and they're sitting there singing blessed assurance Jesus is mine you know and also we shall we shall we shall not be moved uh, we're, we're just you know how many how many non-active sitters in the pews do you have in the church I bet during your staff meetings or uh, you talk about man how can we get these people engaged how can, I think that was one of the questions that somebody asked last week. I mean, last time. How can we get them more engaged in, in what's going on in the church? You have to change their thinking about who they are. You can ask for volunteers until you're blue in the face, but those people aren't going to participate. Because, you see, they've been taught that leaders get things done. And it's the leader's job to do things. So, I'm not a leader. In fact, I'm, I might even be barely a follower. So, what am I doing? I'm coming in. I'm putting my $2 in the plate. And I'm enjoying the show while you take care of my kids. And the teenagers learn how to, how to be good, good people. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sit back. That's what the church is for, right? Mm -hmm. Of course not. How do you engage these people? 
The short answer is you change their thinking. Now, let me undergird that with a little scripture. Remember when uh, Paul's writing, and what does he say? When in doubt, actually read it. <laughs> you can't spell. The good news is I can read it. Look what he says here. In Romans, this is going to be so familiar to you, but looking at it from a leader context, Romans chapter 12. Ready for this? <laughs> Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. By the way, your spiritual service of worship is to what? Present yourself. Present yourself as a what? As a living sacrifice. I call that following with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Okay? And you know the problem with a living sacrifice, right? You've heard that joke. The, the problem with a living sacrifice is once you get it on the altar and set the fire, it always jumps on. <laughs> but we're living sacrifices. And by the way, that's why people can say the things that they say to us in ministry that are hurtful because that's, that's kind of what happens when you're in ministry. And what do you do with it? Just take it to the Lord. We'll talk about that a little bit more specifically later. But here it is. It's your spiritual service worship. Verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? Renewing What have I been talking about? Renewing your mind. Transforming your mind. That's why... <clears throat> I'm not depending on my ver verbiage to, to transform your mind because I don't have, there's nothing in my verbiage that can do that. But if you will entertain in your mind the scriptures that that verbiage depends on and is based upon, that might change your mind. So what do we begin in the process of engaging people in the church? We seek to change their mind. And by the way, You hear a lot in my circles, in seminary circles and stuff, uh, and in preacher meetings. Well, you know, you don't want to preach over the heads of the people. Look, can I just say something about like that? I find that to be extremely offensive. <laughs> you know, if I am, if I am a human being with a brain. And I am coming to someone who supposedly is going to be sharing some very important information with me. I don't, I don't need Tom and Jerry cartoons to communicate to me. Mm. I want something deep. I want something to challenge my thinking. When I was a pastor, I, every week, and I don't do this in pur on purpose, I just love words. But I'd throw out a word and I'd have somebody come up and say, Preacher, what was that word that you used? Look it up. <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to spoon feed you that information. I'm not trying to be arrogant or smart or anything along that line. But I want you, you are now engaging your mind in thinking about the Scriptures. You know, green peas ground up who wants that for lunch? <laughs> no, that's what I had the honor of feeding my granddaughter this past week. It was awesome. And she loved it. Because she doesn't know there's a huge ribeye steak <laughs> yet waiting for her as soon as several more teeth grow in. <laughs> and a little bit of digestive system growth. <laughs> but still, I would encourage you to challenge the thinking of your folks. Now, don't be so deep as to be boring. But 
be deep because the scripture is rich mm. and deep. And, and our folks, if, if, if they don't like that, then you just say, look, all I'm doing is respecting you as a human being with a mind to think about this. You know, we're not in kindergarten anymore. We're, we're, a, we're grown adults. And, and of course, my contention is that one of the problems with our culture at large in the, in the, in the world is that the church is not thinking deeply enough and engaging the world at that level. Yes. And we, the church, it's an indictment on us, we're not teaching folks the, the apologia, if you please, the defense of the scriptures so that, so that you can have a response to someone that challenges that. How do you do that? Well, you can't just do it by simplicity. You, you engage with people and you let them know where they are. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit offline here, but I'm, I'm going to continue. You ready for it? In, he, he goes on, by the, by the renewing of your mind, so that you might prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Wow, well, who doesn't want to live there? in the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Anybody want to go there? That's where I want to be. But I'm not going there unless I'm renewing my mind. Unless I'm changing my thinking. And that's why if you choose as a staff to begin implementing this among your staff and among the people, I want to let you know, it's going to take years more than likely, mm -hmm. to be able to change the minds of people who have been four years thinking about things differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Go ahead. Just a quick verse that comes to my mind. I can't remember the reference. It's in Proverbs somewhere. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Mm -hmm. We're talking about changing, changing the thinking. Um, a man lives out what he thinks in his heart, and so that that the necessity of changing your thinking. Well, and, and let me just pick and it back on that. Let the mind that was in Christ Jesus be in. Yeah, it's you know, called transferring yeah. my mm -hmm. mind to the mind of Christ. Right. Let this mind dwell in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to talk about how he emptied himself and mm -hmm. and. All those beautiful verses, Philippians chapter two, I believe, yeah. is what you're talking about. And so, when when we look in this scripture, all of that rethinking, retooling has to begin in me. Mm -hmm. And then, in your staff conversations, talk about it. I, I don't get this part. Uh, I don't like that part talk about it. That's how we can change our minds is by get engaging with each other in this process. Let me take a question. Sure. Um, um, along with that, uh, we still, uh, I see some people that are very, very hungry for it. Yes. They don't know what they're hungry for, but they know hungry for something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but doesn't that go to that part also? Not just the ones that um, that's not engaging, but there's some that want to, want to be engaged. And sometimes I think we may miss that point also. You follow me? Miss which part? Uh, that the person that's hungry for the for something to change in them. Right. They don't know how to go about getting it. So, um, so the level of hunger or resistance okay. is is still going to be engaged by renewing the mind. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the, the beautiful thing, if you have somebody who's open to it, then it, it, it's a whole lot easier to pour a cup of coffee into somebody's coffee cup if it's not full. Yeah. That's a little hanging fruit. There. Of, some, yeah. of something else. Yeah. You know, if it's empty, man, just pour it in. <clears throat> you know. But back to this. 
So when in Christ's church you have this lineup, so let's just let's just talk about uh, we'll just talk about the pastor is usually seen as a, a, a head of something. Y'all have elders and deacons. We have deacons. Our, our pastoral staff, I consider our let's elders. Let's just call a staff elder. Okay, and then you have Joe Church member, right? Oh, Josette Church member. <laughs> Trying to be sensitive. Uh, all of these people operate as fellow followers. Mm -hmm. All of them should be given the same level of respect. Amen. All of them should be given the same level of honor. Every, and, and in our culture, you really have to work on recognizing those that don't show up on the front of the bullet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I've got good news for you. If you begin a process of recognizing what I call the frontline soldiers on a regular basis, folks will begin to recognize that's an important part of the church. But if all we're recognizing are the titular individuals and the people with titles and things like that, that's all people are going to aspire to. But in the follower first philosophy, everybody's important in the church. And that, and that will engage them in church activity and fulfillment because that's what people ultimately want is fulfillment. Success, I believe, follows fulfillment because you get to change the definition of success that that fulfillment brings. But if you get success without fulfillment, then you don't get anything but an empty, mm -hmm. uh, a, a hollow shell of something. Mm -hmm. Sort of like an Easter bunny that you think is solid chocolate, but <laughs> you, open, you, you crunch into it and it's either hollow or it's got that marshmallow goo. <laughs> it's just not the same experience. So with this, I want to I let, let you know, you're loving Jesus with all your heart, mind, soul, and strengths. And these are fellow followers, right? Mm -hmm. So based on the definition, what, what is the purpose in being in relationship, in this relationship as pastoral staff and leaders within the body of Christ here. What is, what is your ultimate purpose in relationship? Together it's to honor God. How can you do that? Regardless of organizational position, we're going to love the Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting, listen to that, submitting to fellow followers so that all might fulfill their God-given responsibilities. In other words, your, you have God-given responsibilities in this church, do you know? Yes, you do. You have God-given responsibilities in this church. Right? Mm -hmm. So now, my role is to recognize your God-given responsibility and then to set about making you successful in your responsibilities. It's not necessary to make me... See, it's now changed the focus, hasn't it? It's not, man, I've got to get so-and-so to help me do this because it'll never happen unless I can get that person, that person. Ever. It's not that anymore. It's, I've got this responsibility, but and it'll happen as I give myself away to make it happen for you or to make it happen for you. Now, what if every person in the church gathered the fact that they were a follower-first philosophy person, a follower of Christ, and they recognized... Think about this, Pastor. <coughs> what if the, the Blessed Assurance folks in the pew got this idea? You know, I don't think I have no skill. I, I really don't think I'm a teacher. Um, and I know I'm not a leader. But God's given me a responsibility in this church. You know what my responsibility is? My responsibility is to help that brother right there become the best that he can be. So, I'm going to show up. Boy, wouldn't that be great? Mm -hmm. 
What if when you when you say, hey, look, we've got this need over here, you had a bunch of followers come up and say, okay, I know, I'm, 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 I'm not volunteering, I hate that word. I do too. I'm not volunteering. I'm presenting myself for service before the Lord. Because I have a role and I have a responsibility. I may not have a title. And I may not get paid for it. But it doesn't matter. Because who I am in Christ is a follower of Christ. And the way I can honor Christ is by serving within the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Somebody write that down. That's right. <laughs> Seriously though, doesn't that make sense? I'd make a good book. It would. It would. So why why do why why should we follow? Here's a good question. I'm way ahead of where I should be. Why should we follow a pastor's lead? First of all, you're not commanded to follow a pastor's lead. Because let me let me let me let me, let me finish. Because <laughs> because what the pastor may be leading me contrary to God's word. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's why God says you're led by my word and my spirit, not by a person or a time. Mm -hmm. All right. So, but the beautiful thing is you have a pastor who seeks to humble himself under the Word of God and seeks to find God's direction through that and is occasionally filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, <laughs> led by the Spirit. And by the way, everybody else here has that same capacity. Amen. When you do that, why should you follow Him? Well, because I want, and all these other folks down here, because my role and responsibility here is to submit myself to the pastor so he can be fulfilled in his ministry endeavors. Pastor submits himself over here so that you can be fulfilled Amen. in your ministry endeavors. So the entire predicate of staff interaction in the church is based upon not power and control, but what? Submission. Yeah, Ephesians 5.20, submit yourselves one to another. Yep. Oh, and let me read you a little text here that I thought, every time I read it, it just really, it, it just makes me laugh. You remember that scripture we read out of Romans chapter 12? Mm -hmm. He talks about changing your mind and renewing your mind and, and, and trans, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect. In verse 3, I find that it is so spiritually beautiful that God has Paul right here, this line. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted each a measure of faith. And then he goes into talking about the different members of the body. Mm -hmm. Don't you find it interesting that after he talks about you've got to have the right mindset, the very next thing he says is, it's almost, and I'm, I know I'm, I'm interjecting into the scripture here, but from this perspective, <clears throat> it's almost like Paul says, oh, and for you guys with the titles, don't think you're all that in a bag of chips. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have an RC Cola and a moon pie. Mm -hmm. You are not complete. <laughs> you are not perfect. Mm -hmm. I can just hear that. That just communicates to me. Because for so many years, I thought I was the bag of chips. But now I see, you know what? And what a freeing experience, by the way, mm -hmm. to be a follower of Christ. Ultimately. Man, it frees you up. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I'll tell you another great thing about a follower first philosophy in the church. You know what it is? Everybody's responsible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not just the pastor, not just the staff. Everybody's responsible. Well, 
you know, uh, our church isn't growing. <laughs> yep, it's not. Oh, the pastor must not be doing his, his job because the church is not growing. Well, no, because growing the church is not his job. Amen. Growing the church is Jesus' job. He's going to build the church. Oh, by the way, let me ask you a question. When's the last time you shared the gospel? <laughs> oh, well, that's, that's the preacher's job. Okay, well, let's find that in the Scripture. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's go back to the authority here because the pastor is not the authority. Christ is the head of the church. I mean, we're just trying to follow Him so that we can be in His good and perfect and will. So, here's the beauty of it. The church membership who is chosen, if I can use this term, to covenant together as a body church membership then begins to mean something other than, good, my kids can get married here and you'll bury them. You know, something more than that. It's a place of engagement. It is a place where I, as a follower of Christ, can use what gifts God has given me to serve in what may appear to be the most menial of tasks. It's still spiritually and eternally significant and that's where I live but until we change the mind and I tell you what it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to do it you can share the information but then pray God change the mind. It's just like sharing the gospel in that sense and the fact that you share people the truths of the gospel but you can't convince them to do that. That's a work of the Spirit. It is a work of the Holy Spirit to change the mind of a person to lead them away from self-centeredness to other-centeredness. Because that's where you die. That's, that's where you, you just... And, and by the way, you know, Jesus said, if anyone is willing to is willing to come after me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. Right? Mm -hmm. so when you take up your cross, you know, what what is that? I call that a good place to die. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's why God is you in the position where you are, because He loves you, and He wants you to die. Because when you die. You get to live. Mm -hmm. It's one of the paradoxes of Scripture. Mm -hmm. And so the more we die to ourselves, the more we live to Christ, and the more God is honored. Mm -hmm. The more I lie awake at night and go, man, I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> I hate this dying business. Can I just say that? Mm -hmm. Everything in me hates to die. Mm -hmm. Man, I want to live. I want to be the man. Mm -hmm. I want to be looked up to. I want to be respected. And then you live life. And that's not the way it is. So what do you get to do? You get to lay before the Lord everything that you value. And say, all right, God, it's all you. I'm following you. If you want to burn that up, it's not mine, it's all yours. I'll give it to you. I'm just, just do this for me. Enable me by your Spirit to follow you by obeying your word. Wow. That's the follow the first law. All right. It is now 10.58. I'm open for questions. What do, you, what do you think? Just first blush. Does that make sense? Does it, does it speak to you? Can you see it happening here? Okay. I, I don't want to usurp the time, and I don't want to be on. But, you know, just kind of back to the beginning of what you were saying today. Um, 
of changing changing the mind and the mentality. And um, I don't, I'm not sure that it's oftentimes a lack of willingness of individuals to serve. Um, I think sometimes we condition adults in, in our church bodies to that. And, and here's what I thought for a long time, and uh, Vicki and Laura and Antoine don't take offense what I'm saying. But in our age-segregated ministries, we, with the right heart, we wanted to gear those ministries for those kids. Okay. And, but at the time when they reach adulthood, they're so used to having things done for them that when they reach adulthood, they kind of expect, well, and we've conditioned them their whole life mm -hmm. to, to have the plate at the table set for them. Sure. So I think, you know, when I, as I'm thinking out loud on this, and <clears throat> we do a good job at this, I think, here, is, is to condition those kids as a girl, part of that discipling them is discipling them in, in, in servitude as well, to serve. So that's a real important thing as I was thinking about this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any other comments? Something, someone want to respond to that? I mean, we just live in an, we live in an on-demand culture right now. Uh -huh. uh, and so when you have the understanding of a living sacrifice, it's just so countercultural to <laughs> how we live. Right. Uh, and so there's so many demands on us as a people uh, and so it's just it's a difficult mentality, but it's a needed mentality. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I cringe every time I hear it on television when they do run the commercials. You, you, you need this insurance, this insurance that you deserve. It's yeah. your money, and you deserve it. And you, yeah. you <laughs> deserve it. And what, 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 is, what is that? What is that? That is appealing straight to the human desire for self-centeredness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I do deserve it. Yeah. I told one lady one time, forgive me, um, she came up and she, because I was talking about that, and she said, well, you were talking about whether we don't deserve it. I said, well, I know that we deserve something. She said, what do we deserve? I said, death, hell, and the grave. <laughs> <laughs> of course, she, her eyes got that big, and she didn't ask me any more questions. I don't know why. Oh. I may have a minute. I may have a minute. But it uh, doesn't really matter, it's the truth. Yeah. Right. Uh, some, some, somebody, yes. Vicky. So is this fleshing out the submitting to one another thing, is that just done on an individual basis? Is it done, so, so I have Sunday school people that I serve with, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, and I'm in a leadership position. So when I'm fleshing out submitting to them, I know it's got to be more than words. Mm -hmm. So is that is that basically done? Like I love on Mark and Donna and Dave, and just that they know that I love them and appreciate them, and will do what I can to help them. But is that what that means as far as submitting to one another, or does it go beyond that in some way? So let me let me take it a little bit further because you're on the right track. Okay. Where would it go beyond that? Serving them? Yes. Where would it go beyond serving them? By loving on them and caring for them. I don't know. That's what I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say where do we go beyond that? I can't hear Yes. Where, where, she says, how do you flesh out submitting to one another? How, is that just going and saying, okay, here I am. Um, Make sure I got you right here, mm -hmm. and that is, I'm gonna love on them. I'm gonna support them, and they know that they can ask me anything, and I'll try to do it for them so that they can be successful in their, their responsibilities in the church. Don't let her kid you, though. There's a joke one time. I called her my boss, and she returned immediately and said, "No, you're my boss." Well, there you go. <laughs> she, she gets that, that, so there you go. <laughs> And so, she does do all that. Okay. Yeah. She makes sure we're okay. Do we need anything? And I got the inclination that, that was the case. <laughs> that's not why I'm asking. <laughs> A little bit right now, but that's all right. Don't, don't let that happen. See, that's, so, that shows a lack of ego. So, can we be but, uh, proactive to find ways to submit to them? Is it that, or what does it look like? I, I, and the question was, 
Do you go beyond that? Mm -hmm. My initial response to you is this. That love that you share is submitting. Mm -hmm. And that respect that you give them is that submission. Mm -hmm. Because what you're not doing is you're not recruiting them to fill a place on a org chart and giving them a quarterly and say, good luck. I got a sneaking suspicion there's a lot of people in our churches who are recruited to do that, but there's nobody loving on them, nobody supporting them in that process. So can you go beyond it? I would only say the context would have to dictate that. But right now, you know, how, how much conflict can you have with somebody who loves you to death and supports you like crazy? <laughs> you know, it's kind of hard to do. It's kind of hard. If, you, if, 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 if I know you love me and you're fleshing that out with the amount of time that you're giving to me and, and the amount of love that you're showing to me as a person, not just a person in my program, right. but just a person. That right there is what I'm, what I'm thinking about. Okay? Because, all right. Miss Vicki, you're not going to get a, a proper answer to that because you're already doing the outlook. <laughs> <laughs> so, how much time do we have? I, I'm 11.05. I don't want to... We're, I mean, 11.15 is what we said. But we okay, 11.15. It's like the Romanian told me, as long as the Holy Spirit allows. Yeah. And the, then the interpreter said, sometimes the Holy Spirit's finished long before the preacher. <laughs> <laughs> See, what I like about going to those countries and being interpreted is that I can say, and Jesus saves you by His grace. And the interpreter goes, <laughs> just keep going and going and going and going and go. I think I said that. <laughs> more, than, his own more than likely, he has got a little bit encouraged by that. All right. <laughs> yes, sir. I do have a question. This is a different church, and the pastor looked at me and said, and I do believe this to be the case to an extent, but he said, I God has placed me as a spiritual head and covering and the anointing flows through me to the church and lead and helps to lead you. And what we're saying is Christ is the head of the church. We also want to respect the pastor and follow the pastor. How does that how does that work when I know he, he's saying and he was dogmatic, this is my way. It, if it doesn't come from me, it didn't come from God. You know that that he was, was not saying that, or was he saying that? He was saying that. Oh, okay. So he was saying that. But in some respects, I do think that we are to we are to serve our pastor as a spiritual leader and covering, and the the anointing flows through him. However, I, does that make any sense? It does. It does. Uh, let me say that we'll, we'll uh, address the role of the pastor in a chapter in the book that says who gets to tell who what to do. Uh, and, but to address your particular question, you, there, there are a lot of elements in your question that probably need to be addressed individually. Uh, not the least of which is the concept of God has placed me here as the spiritual leader. I, I, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. I find that to be very dangerous yeah. uh, thinking. Well, I don't. I, I, I don't see when it comes to the roles that we'll talk about that people have within the body of Christ. I'm very literal about what it says and I think that many times we may add something to what it says uh, 
especially if I'm in that role and I see myself as the spiritual leader, <coughs> then it, it almost becomes ex cathedra, uh, from the throne, if you please, mm -hmm. where the Pope speaks and what he speaks is actually the Word of God and that, that must be obeyed kind of thing. I don't know that that's going there, but it's dangerously close to it if that's your self-concept. Uh, the self-concept that I see pastors need to have is a servant who, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is seeking to, to follow the Word and then to teach the Word. When Paul says that the role of the pastor is to shepherd the flock and do the work of an evangelist, I don't see anywhere in here where it says that you're the spiritual leader of the church. Because all of us are filled with the with the Holy Spirit, yeah, and, and the pastor doesn't have any more Holy Spirit than the janitor right. of the of the church, who is a believer in Christ. The only difference between, say, the pastor and a deacon or a staff member within the body of Christ is the position that they have and the role that they play within the body of Christ and the responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I've had people call me before because they thought I was the spiritual leader of the church and say, Pastor, I'm in the hospital. Come pray for me. I said, you don't want me to pray for you right now. <laughs> I'm so angry. I'm so <laughs> sad. You don't, you don't want to pray for me. I've been doing deacons all day. Uh, uh, I said, you, you need to call Miss Jane. Miss Jane picks up paper around the church. Now she's a prayer warrior. You want her praying for you right now. You see, that, that whole idea... Now, and then there's another concept of the anointing. And, and that is a very, forgive me because it might be uh, a little uh, controversial, and it's a little funny, but it's a liquid term. <laughs> you got it? The, the anointing of the oil and things. But it is a liquid term, and it's used so, uh, shall I say, cavalierly many times within churches to give more quote unquote authority and power to an individual than he or she needs to have. Oh, they're anointed. Amen. Who says? Mm -hmm. Maybe I just want them to be. Because if you're anointed and you give me instruction and I do what you say and it doesn't work, then I get to blame you. Not me. Not me for being responsible to God because I have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I have the Holy Spirit within me. And so, God, God is... He, he wants us to live our lives individually under Him and corporately submitting to one another. All of us submitted under Him and corporately submitting to one another. Now, there's no question in my mind that some people have what you might want to call an anointing to do certain things, such as there are people with the gift of teaching. It's unbelievable. There are people with the gift of evangelist. Notice I didn't say evangelism. Mm -hmm. There's no such gift. A gift of evangelist. And it just seems like every time I share the gospel with somebody, they go... You know, and they're, they're sleepwalking through it. But then this guy gets on an elevator with somebody, and by the second floor, you, the door's open, and the guy's on his knees coming to Jesus. I don't understand that. <laughs> that doesn't happen to me. I'm more of an X factor guy. I come in, and there's an X on that person's timeline. I walk into them, I'm the X. And they just happen to run into the gospel that I can share with them. And then God's going to take them down the road, and hopefully there'll be another X down the road. And, and as the gospel moves into their lives. Mm -hmm. But I hope that addressed your question. No, it did. Yeah. Yeah. Randy, one other thing we have to incorporate in that too is the, is the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer. Right. You know, um, that's another thing to unpack for some other time. But, um, and we can talk about that. Yeah. The, the whole, because I'll have to tell you, Pastor, there's some things about some teaching in that quote unquote priesthood of yeah. the believer. Folks, the priesthood of the believer got me going. Mm -hmm. Is
is about service. Right. It's not about power. Correct. I don't have any power with God that He doesn't enable me to have through His Spirit. Yeah. Well, with that harkens back to the priesthood, they were called their role was to serve. That's all they did. Exactly. They took the sacrifice, they killed it, and they threw it on the altar. Yeah, and served. then they took the meat out of the pots and ate it. Right. Speaking of which, it's 11.15. And it's time to... <laughs> but, hey guys, as you can see, we made it through page 11. <laughs> and you know what? You have the advantage because you can reread your last assignment for our December meeting, yes. uh, November meeting. November. But is that okay with everybody? Yes. And uh, we will make our way through this, but I appreciate the opportunity yeah. to unpack it. And the date of our, it's not the third week, the third, third, two, what is this, Tuesday? Yes. Yeah. It's November the 16th will be our next time together. November the 16th, because the following week is Thanksgiving week. Okay. Oops. I have a different day. No, I'm fine. Yeah, it, it, you had to go to the 23rd, right? I had to move it to the 23rd. Oh, okay, so it's the 23rd. Because I'm flying out to Fort Worth uh, to uh, Evangelical Theology. We just have to figure out the room because of the SF. Okay, that's right. The so, 23rd. Okay. I know that's right. Tuesday. But that's the fourth it's Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. Yes, it would be a, It would be the fourth Tuesday of that yeah. month. Yeah. And I apologize for getting this all planned. But, uh, hey, guys, can, can let me make a suggestion to us real quick as how we, maybe one recommendation of how we can foster this conversation to the next time we meet. Yes. Maybe just general, high, you know. In, in general, one, one. just talk among yourselves. Mm -hmm. By the way, don't share this information with other folks necessarily. I'm not, we're not trying to keep it a secret. But if you don't have the background in the conversation, it can sometimes yeah. Confuse folks yeah. because it is confusing unless you start at the beginning and move forward. Uh, this is not Gnosticism. <laughs> this is not secret knowledge. Yeah. Um, but it's trying to communicate truth to folks without raising defensive barriers. Um, so talk among yourselves. Mm -hmm. a address the information in the book. Agree and disagree and then write down questions and bring your questions so that we can uh, join a conversation together because uh, I always learn in these environments and I really appreciate your love for the Lord and your continuing service of Him and one another here. Pastor, can I lead us in a prayer? Yeah, the video will be uploaded within a day or two, right, Becky? So if you want to go back. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Father, for the time together. Mm -hmm. Thank you that uh, you have enabled us to renew our mind mm -hmm. so that we can humble ourselves and trust Christ. Thank you that in our lives we have renewed our minds mm -hmm. so that the Word of God becomes our authority in everything that we do and say. And I thank you, Lord, that we've renewed our minds as we have um, taken on roles here in the church and in our lives that, that have responsibilities and that we can continue to follow you by taking up our cross daily and dying yourself and living in the power of your spirit. And I pray that you will continue to do that for me and for my brothers and sisters in Christ, my fellow followers. In Jesus' name, amen.